Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Cancer Chatters webinar, Cervical Screening by Self-Collection, Taking Your Health into Your Own Hands. My name is Melissa Treby, and I'm the Cancer Education and Screening Manager here at Cancer Council WA, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this webinar this afternoon. Before we commence, I would just like to acknowledge the country on which we're all meeting today. And in the spirit of deepening relationships, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and owners of the land that we're on here today. You may be on different land, but that's the Wajak people from the Noongar Nation. And I'd like to recognise their continuing connection to the land, the waters and community. And I also pay my respect to their elders and extend that respect to any Aboriginal people or Torres Strait Islanders that might be joining us today or working in this area. With today's webinar, we would encourage you to ask questions and you can submit your questions via the question and answer function at the bottom of the screen anytime throughout the presentation. And then they will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We will also be sending an online evaluation survey after the event. And we really do encourage you and ask you to complete this so that we can continue to improve the education events that we do provide for you. Today's speaker, I'm very delighted to introduce. Our guest speaker is Ms. Beth Chuada, who, who is from the Western Australian Cervical Cancer Prevention Program. Beth holds a bachelor's degree in health science, health promotion, and since graduating, she has used her public health skills in the sexual health and bloodborne virus sector, working predominantly with migrant and new arrival communities and also in her current role, which is as the Senior Health Promotion Officer at the WA Cervical Cancer Prevention Program. Beth is also a published author in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. And in 2019, she joined the WA CCPP to explore her interest in women's health. And this has really been something that she's enjoyed and contributing to this space is something that she values greatly. So Beth is here to talk to us today about the exciting new development in the cervical screening program. And that is the introduction of self-collection as one of the options for cervical screening. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce and welcome Beth. Thanks, Beth. Thank you, Melissa, for the warm welcome and for Cancer Council for hosting this webinar. So my name is Beth Chibata. I'm the Senior Health Promotion Officer, thank you, at the WA Cervical Cancer Prevention Program. Our program is the state arm of the National Cervical Screening Program. And our goal is to increase participation rates in the cervical screening in Australia. Thank you for the acknowledgement of country, Melissa, that you gave. So today we are here to talk about the new self-collection option. That's the hot topic. Um, to do so, I'd like to introduce just some background knowledge that will help us understand the option and be able to realise why it's safe and effective and accurate. So we'll touch on cervical cancer, why cervical screening is important, the new self-collection option, who should have screening and where we can go for screening. And please uh, chuck all your questions um, in the chat because I'm keen to answer any questions. So let's just start off to talk about where the cervix is. So if you see on the diagram, you can see the uterus above. So that's the, um, the big one up there and the vagina down below and in between is the cervix. So the cervix acts a little bit like a window or a door between the uterus and the vagina. It looks a little bit like a donut. It's quite small in size. And that's the thing that you hear dilates to 10 centimetres during labour. So that's what we're talking about today, cervix. The cervical cancer is cancer located on the cervix. So what causes cervical cancer? If you think about causes of cancer, say, for example, we know skin exposure can lead to um, skin cancer. If you think about smoking, we understand, for example, lung cancer is linked with that amongst other cancers. So what do we know causes cervical cancer? Well, we know the human papillomavirus, or HPV, is the main cause of cervical cancer. So HPV is a virus that's shared from human to human through skin-to-skin -skin sexual contact. It's very common. So most people in their lives will be exposed to the HPV virus. 
Although it's very common, it doesn't always lead to cervical cancer. In fact, most of the time, our bodies will fight the virus and clear it within one to two years. It's just in some cases it persists, and in those cases it can then lead on to cervical cancer. HPV has over 100 types of HPV, and we know that about 40 are linked. Um, so, yeah, so the main ones to, um, that are causing cervical cancer are types 16 and 18, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the main thing to establish here is that we do know the main cause of cervical cancer, and that's HPV. So let's just have a look at a timeline of persistent HPV and the progression to cervical cancer. So if we have a look at a healthy cervix, along comes HPV, and it can start to change the cells on the cervix. So we start to get some abnormal cells or precancerous cells. So they're not cancer, but they're starting not to be happy. They're a bit unhealthy. What usually happens for most people is that things return to normal. HPV is cleared by the body, and the cervix remains healthy and happy. Although sometimes HPV persists and it progresses, and then over time it can lead to cervical cancer. So that's the timeline. I usually ask people to guess, but I'll let you know that it takes about 10 to 15 years for this persistence and progression to happen. And so as you can see, it's very slow it takes a long time and that gives us quite a lot of opportunity to intervene or to take action and prevent things from becoming cervical cancer. And obviously the earlier we intervene, the easier the treatment is going to be. So how can we prevent cervical cancer? We have two main strategies. The first one is the HPV vaccine program. So in Australia, we offer the HPV vaccine to school aged children in a school program. It's free and we, we usually give it to age uh, 14, 12 to 14 year olds. And this is because we know HPV is shared from human to human, skin to skin sexual contact. So we'd like to give the vaccine before sexual contact begins. And that means that the vaccine will be effective. You need two vaccines and uh, the, the vaccine uh, is free. If people wanted to access the vaccine as adults, you can talk to your GP about accessing the vaccine as an adult, but it's not free, it comes with a cost. And that's because it's only effective before sexual contact. And the HPV vaccine, it, it covers a range of HPV strains, including the two main types that we know can cause or have an association with cervical cancer, and that's type 16 and 18. But HPV vaccine doesn't cover all types of HPV, which is why it's important to access screening even if you had HPV vaccine. So we need both strategies, the vaccine and the cervical screening test. So the cervical screening test is a little bit like a detective looking for clues. And so the two main clues that we are looking for is the HPV virus, because we know that that virus is responsible or associated with most cervical cancers. And the other clue is changes to the cells. So we wanna look at the cervix cells. We wanna see, are they healthy? Are they happy? Are there some that are abnormal and changing? Are there precancerous cells? So they're the two things that we're looking for. And the way that we do that, here we're coming to uh, the topic of today. So there are two ways you can have your cervical screening test. You can have a doctor take a sample, and I'm gonna talk about that more in a minute. And the other way is for you to take your own sample. And before I talk about either of those, I just do wanna reiterate that both options are safe, accurate, and effective. And I hope the behind um, the information that I've just offered can help establish that confidence that the self-collect option is safe, accurate, and effective. So let's talk about the top, uh, the first option, which is a doctor taking a sample. So when a doctor takes a sample, it's taken the same way that a pap smear used to be taken. 
So you'll be uh, in a private space with a healthcare provider. You'll be given um, something to cover yourself and asked to remove clothing from the waist down. The doctor or the nurse or the provider will use a speculum and an endocervical brush to take a sample from the cervix. So they're able to view the cervix and take a sample from that cervix. And that sample is sent to the laboratory. At the laboratory, they're able to check for two clues. So they're able to look for the virus. Is the virus present? If they find the virus, they can use the exact same sample straight away to look for the cells. So they can check those cells. Is HPV affecting those cells? So are the cells um, still happy and safe or are they starting to change? Are there some precancerous cells? Are there the beginnings of those cell, cell changes? And then as a result of uh, those outcomes, the, there's a range of different next steps. So if HPV isn't found, then we know that woman is safe. She can come back in five years with peace of mind that everything is healthy and good. If we do find cell changes, depending on what type of cell changes or precancerous cells are found, there's a whole range of different next steps. <clears throat> so collecting your own sample, again, this option is facilitated within a healthcare setting or with a health professional. They would offer you a swab. It looks very similar to a COVID flock swab, but it doesn't go in the nose, it goes in the vagina. So the doctor would explain how to take the test. When you look at the swab, there's a little red mark on it where you would place your fingers to hold the swab so you know how far it needs to be inserted. And you can see in that image, the swab is only swabbing the vagina. So we're not trying to find the cervix because that would be very difficult for us. We're only swabbing the vagina and we rotate the swab for about 30 seconds. That swab is then placed back in the tube, given directly back to the health provider and sent off to the laboratory. At the laboratory, what they can do is they can check for HPV. They can't check the cells uh, of the cervix because the sample hasn't been taken from the cervix. So what this option allows us is we can check, does someone have HPV? If they don't have HPV, we know that everything's healthy and good. And so that person it has peace of mind, knows that they just need to come back in five years for their next routine screen. If we do find HPV, and I don't know how to go back actually. I can't read that. Is that previous? Next, next one down? Oh, this one. Yeah. Do that again. So if we do find HPV with a self-collect sample, we would invite someone back and say, can you come back? because we need to take a sample of your cervix. And that's done with a healthcare provider taking the sample, using the speculum so they can see the cervix, take a sample of the cervix, and so that the laboratory can check the health of those cells to see if HPV is impacting those cells. So that's the main difference between the two options. So the first option when the doctor takes a test is they're able to check straight away for the health of the cells. If we choose the self-collect option, it's just as accurate at detecting HPV, but if we do find HPV, there'll be a second appointment to follow up. Um, so one might be more convenient than the other. So who can access self-collection? So cervical screening is available for all women and people with a cervix aged 25 to 74 years. And self-collection is now included as one of the two options. So since July 1st this year, both options should be offered as an available choice for every woman accessing screening. So anyway, you can access a cervical screening test. You should be offered both options for you to choose. So cervical screening is for all asymptomatic women it's for uh, people living with a disability, it's for people uh, within the LGBTQI people, women who have sex with women, it's for women who are going through menopause or have gone through menopause, it's for um, 
all kinds of women. So when do we have cervical screening? It's every five years, unless you have symptoms or you need a follow-up test. So a follow-up test is say we find HPV or we find um, some cells that are not quite right, then the pathway would change. There's other follow-up tests and things that we would need to do. And common symptoms that we would um, be, want to be mindful of would be abnormal bleeding. So that means bleeding that's not normal. For example, bleeding between your periods, bleeding during or after sex, and uh, pain within the pelvic area. So those symptoms need to be addressed and seen by a doctor immediately. Um, and those symptoms are not just re restricted to cervical cancer. There could be multiple reasons why a woman has those symptoms, but they do need exploring. I've added a number here. That's the number for the National Cancer Screening Register. So the National Cancer Screening Register or the NCSR, they are responsible for uh, keeping the data related to our cervical screening history. So that means if you change doctor or your doctor retires, the next person who conducts your screening can still have a good understanding of your screening history and any results and follow-up required. Um, and they're also able to tell you when you're due. So if you're wondering when you might need your next cervical screening test or when your last one was, or um, what's your next step, you can call that number and they can let you know. The NCSR also send invitation letters. So when people turn 25, we, they send a letter out to say you're due for your first screening test and they send reminder letters. So when we are due or overdue, they'll send letters. So you might uh, be familiar with them and have received one in the past. So where can we, where can we access cervical screening and the two options? So anywhere where there's GPs or doctors available, women's health centres and Aboriginal health services. I recommend women's health centres for people um, who might be a bit hesitant for cervical screening because they often have longer appointment times and they can, uh, they can offer little tricks and tweaks around how they offer cervical screening. They're more familiar with working with interpreters and um, because self-collection is a fairly new option, we are still in the phase of preparing uh, the healthcare sector. So what I can guarantee is that the main women's health centres are prepared and ready right now to offer self-collection. Um, and we're still working with some uh, GP clinics to make sure that they're ready. So if you're very keen for self-collection, I recommend uh, Googling one of the women's health centres within the metro areas finding the one that's closest to you and making an appointment there. <clears throat> so the main things to remember is that cervical cancer can be prevented and we know what causes most cervical cancers, it's HPV. So the HPV vaccine and cervical screening tests are the best way to protect yourself. All women and people with the cervix aged 25 to 74 years can access cervical screening. And it's done every five years. And we now have two ways you can access cervical screening tests. So you can have a doctor take the sample or you can take the sample yourself. And that's the end of my slides. I did just wanna leave an email address. If you did wanna ask me a question, share a story or feedback, that would be the best way to contact me. And we're just about to launch a new campaign that promotes the importance of cervical screening and the two options. And there will be some information that expands on what we've touched on today, because this is a very uh, brief summary of the topic. And that's the website address for some more information. So feel free to reach out there. Do you want to leave sufficient time for questions? So we we'll open it up and see if there's any in the chat or if people want to ask. So a common question that we get asked is, can I access self-collection through a pharmacy or will it be sent to my house? At the moment, the policy 
states that self-collection must be facilitated by a health professional. So the policy is flexible enough for the health professional to determine where that sample is taken. It's recommended that someone takes it within the healthcare clinic, just because we know that statistically speaking, it's more likely to happen if it's done straight away without um, you know, someone taking it home and maybe forgetting it or misplacing it um, or forgetting to then send it off to the laboratory. But it is up to the health professional to work with the patient to determine where they take the sample. Um, at the moment, it is still facilitated in that way. So you can't pick up the samples, say, at the pharmacy or have the sample sent to you at home. It's always at the moment facilitated um, with, with a health professional in the healthcare setting. Good question. Sorry, I can't read that from here. So I want to read that. Worth mentioning that any practice nurses will be able to assist with this, even if not when it's solicited. Yes, that's true. So um, a lot of our um, nurse practitioners are up to date with the policy and are prepared to offer the cervical screening test options. So yeah, maybe I should broaden my recommendation that um, if you're interested in self-collection option, book with your trusted healthcare provider, wherever that is. But when you make your booking, just double check that they're ready to offer self-collection. And if they're not, encourage them to get ready. <laughs> How do I know if I'm eligible if I'm due for my cervical screening? That's another question. Yep. Yeah. So the main ways to know if you're due for your cervical screening would be if you are sent a letter from the National Cancer Screening Register to say that you're due. The other way would be your doctor. If you have a family doctor or someone that you go to regularly, they might have it on file and also be sending reminder letters. Otherwise, you can call the National Register on that number and I can bring that up again on the screen if we need, that 1800 number. And you can call and ask when you're due. <clears throat> Shannon, do you mind picking up that number for me? Read it out. Yes, that's correct. Some cervical cancers are not related to HPV. It's a very small percentage of cervical cancers that are not related to HPV. Unfortunately, those cancers can't be detected in a national cervical screening program. So we wouldn't be, at the moment, we have no way of determining and finding those small number of uh, cervical cancers that are not related to HPV in a, in a screening program. And because they are such a small number, we don't have a national screening program to, to reach that, that small number. And as we go along, what we'll find is as we get better and better at preventing cervical cancers um, that are caused by HPV, the percentage or proportion of those that aren't related to HPV will increase. But it's not that those uh, very rare cancers are increasing in number, it's just that we're getting better at preventing the majority of them. If, if women have any symptoms though of cervical cancer or any related symptoms, like I mentioned, there we can explore um, without, without the cervical screening program. So this program is for asymptomatic women um, and there are other ways of finding cervical cancer, just not at a national screening program level. Well, I hope that what I've shared today gives a little bit more confidence to the self-collection option and the accuracy that it offers. And I hope that um, giving this information has allowed you to consider the two options available to you and that you can make uh, your choice next time that you're due. Thank you all for tuning in.